I had previously done a video on MTV's Headbangers Ball, and I was honestly surprised at how popular and how much engagement that video got. And there was a lot of people in that video that actually asked me to do another video on MTV show 120 Minutes. So here we are. Today, let's talk about the rise and fall of 120 Minutes. It's a show that's been described as the pitchfork of its time, whatever the hell that means. If you guys saw my Headbangers Ball video, then you would know that the mid 80s were a weird time for MTV. They had been playing a lot of heavy metal and I'm using that word loosely because it's kind of a catch-all term for hard rock and glam metal because that's how it was reported by the press at that point in time. It was by 1985 that MTV started playing less metal because their management thought that it was just a fad and their focus groups, at least that's what they claimed, thought the channel played too much metal. I also want to interject and point out that in my opinion, I'm assuming the Parents Music Resource Center may have also had an impact on MTV programming choices because it was apparent from the lower level people who worked at the network that the brass at MTV were more interested in pleasing advertisers than viewers. MTV soon shifted to more pop and dance oriented artists and their ratings took a hit. It was by early 86 on the eve of the network's fifth anniversary, MTV's relevance was being questioned. Something needed to change to make the network uh, cool and hip again, and the network tried to change things up. One of the things they did in late 1985 was a show called Metal Mania, which served as a precursor to Headbangers Ball, which would premiere two years later. The show had big ratings, but a disagreement between Twisted Sisters, Dee Snyder, and MTV over the fact that the host was doing the gig for free led to him leaving the show. In March of 86, they premiered a new show called 120 Minutes, and in April of 86, the LA Times would publish an article with the headline that read, MTV fights back with 120 minutes. The article would go on to state, and I quote, given up on MTV and its deja vu parade of lookalike videos, you're not alone. The cable channel's ratings have fallen lately, but in the last few weeks, MTV has instituted two new programs, the new video hour and 120 minutes that seem designed to pull back viewers and to answer complaints from record companies about the lack of airtime for lesser known acts. The better show is 120 minutes, which concentrates on videos by new and a relatively uncommercial artist. While people may think of big budget music videos when the topic of MTV's golden years comes up, the network also ventured into weird territory as they showcased lesser known acts who made videos on a shoestring budget. There would be a show called The Cutting Edge that debuted in 1983 on MTV and it served as a precursor to 120 Minutes. It was also referred to as IRS Records Presents The Cutting Edge. MTV would team up with IRS Records who actually produced the show and it was a great marketing tool for the label. They showcased a lot of their own artists and other groups not shown on MTV's regular rotation. In fact, IRS's co-founder Miles Copeland III would describe himself to Billboard magazine as, and I quote, the only record company executive ever to have his own show on MTV. The cutting edge was instrumental in introducing Madonna. Yeah, that Madonna. Red Hot Chili Peppers and REM to mainstream audiences. The show would air monthly on Sunday nights and they went through a variety of hosts, including Jules Holland, before Peter Zaremba of the band The Flesh Tones actually became the permanent host. He would make a thousand dollars an episode, something that was a lot of money at the time for him. The show had a lot of creative freedom, with the program's director revealing in the book I Want My MTV, it was bands that otherwise who might not appear on MTV. This was one place where you could see Henry Rollins read poetry. We filmed Morrissey in his bathroom at a hotel and gave him a stack of envelopes, each with a single word inside it. He would open the envelope and talk to a little camera. The word might be beauty, so he'd talk a bit about beauty. The show would also feature interviews with the musicians themselves and showcase live performances. The show was also instrumental in featuring underground or regional music scenes in LA, North Carolina, and Texas. In fact, in 1986, the LA Times would write a piece about MTV on their fifth anniversary, stating, and I quote, watch MTV in the night, especially on the weekend, and the real changes become apparent. Almost any time the channel puts something on other than the not so merry go around of videos, it becomes considerably more interesting. MTV, for all its faults, is still much more in touch with modern pop music than any other cable channel or network. Where to start looking for MTV's better side, they would ask? Try The Cutting Edge. Edge is simply the best program about pop music that we have. It lives up to its excellent name, spotlighting the most interesting and adventurous new acts. It was also 1986 that MTV launched 120 Minutes, a new program that was focused exclusively on alternative rock and underground music. The Cutting Edge, meanwhile, would end a year later in 1987. I also want to point out 
that college radio was another place that you could hear alternative or underground music. In fact, college radio was really instrumental in the 80s and 90s in breaking some bands, and I've actually covered some of those acts on my channel. The cutting edge in later 120 minutes became a home for outcasts and misfits, and by the mid 80s, MTV was set to be responsible for creating the, and I quote, trench coat wearing, cure loving, zine reading kid of the 80s. It was in the mid 80s that MTV would hire a kid named Dave Kendall, who was originally from the UK. He was actually living in America on a student's visa and was a contributor to Melody Maker. He was working odd jobs like cleaning apartments and being a busboy at restaurants. And it was one day he was doing a job cleaning someone's house when the lady who lived there said that they had MTV. He had no clue what MTV was, but he soon became mesmerized with the channel and actually got a job there as a producer. Kendall wanted to make alternative rock more prevalent on the network and he would recall to Consequence of Sound how 120 Minutes was actually his idea. He would add, back then the word alternative wasn't being used. There was just a hodgepodge of styles. Punk, post-punk, gothic, synth pop, new romantic, ska, psychedelic, garage rock, etc. MTV's new program 120 Minutes would air on Sunday nights and showcase groups like Dinosaur Jr., The Jesus and Mary Chain, Sonic Youth, and The Replacements, which stood in sharp contrast to what was typically played during primetime hours on MTV, artists like Rick Springfield and Pat Benatar. In fact, even the quality of the video stood in such sharp contrast to what you saw during MTV's main rotation, which were big budget music videos. Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters would remark in the book I Want My MTV, on 120 Minutes you'd see a video that was made with a pixel vision camera and Super 8 and bad lighting. I found it endearing. This band made their own video. I'd much rather see a school play than a Broadway musical. Even some of the bands like R.E.M. who got considerable airplay on 120 Minutes were actually shocked at how bad they could make their videos look and still get airplay on MTV. One of the best examples of this was R.E.M.'s video for Fall On Me which was shot at a rock quarry in Indiana. It was meant to be the antithesis to everything else on MTV and funny enough the network extensively played the video. It made R.E.M. think that there's nothing they couldn't do. Much like Headbangers Ball in its early days, 120 minutes would go through a revolving door of hosts who were largely plucked from the other shows on MTV like J.J. Jackson, Martha Quinn, and Kevin Seal, who actually hosted the show for a couple of years. Uh, Dave Kendall would take over the official hosting duties of the show beginning in 1989. Kendall, in addition to being a producer for the show, was also a writer and he even wrote himself a part on the show doing record reviews. It was host Kevin Seal one day who got pulled to another assignment suggested that Kendall host, and while well, the rest is history. The show staff actually used to goof on Kendall's wig, which he wore. He would claim it was actually a hair weave, and he was a fan of the new Romantics era. And there was even one episode of 120 Minutes where John Lydon poked fun at his hair, but apparently that clip never aired. The time slot for 120 Minutes was pretty rough. Kendall would recall to Consequence of Sound, the main reason the show had a late night time slot was that the ratings were consistently poor, or rather consistently average. Although a small group of people were watching the show fanatically. The majority that just wanted the top 40 hits weren't. 120 minutes, especially in the 90s, became notable for live performances that were actually done at MTV Studios. Uh, the show would even release several album compilations called Nevermind the Mainstream, The Best of 120 Minutes. Kendall would actually leave the show in 1992 and he felt like his time was up at the network. He would go on to host a program called Music Scoop, which was actually on Fox stations that aired in 93 and 94 before it got abruptly canceled. He would later go on to work for Thai Television as a producer. He could even be heard on Sirius Satellite Radio on the channel First Wave, but it seems like he's no longer doing the program. Originally, Matt Pinfield auditioned to be his replacement around 92 or 93, and actually in Pinfield's book, he talked about showing up the audition wearing a Morrissey shirt with a hole in it, and he had no copy to read. He just showed up and they asked him to talk about his career and what kind of music he was into. He thought the audition went fairly well, and so did the folks at MTV. It was now 1993 and MTV would sometimes have bands host 120 Minutes and Depeche Mode were on and they were promoting their record at the time, Songs of Faith and Devotion. They didn't want to host, so MTV reached out to Pinfield, who got called in to interview them. He hadn't gotten the job yet on the network. They kind of wanted to see how he would do on the air. You guys can actually go check out that interview on YouTube. MTV would end up giving the hosting job to a guy named Louis Largent, who was at the time the vice president of music programming at the network. Largent had long roots in the alternative rock music scene, both on MTV 
TV and on rock radio. He would host until 1995 and Pinfield remarked in his book that he thought maybe he was too old for the demographic who watched 120 minutes and thought that maybe his baldness may have had something to do with it as well. But the programmers at MTV in 120 minutes were still big fans of Pinfield as he was a radio DJ at the time in New Jersey for the hugely popular and influential alternative rock station WHTG FM. Pinfield got a call in early 95 from MTV saying that they had lost some people and they offered Pinfield the chance to join the network as the manager of music talent and programming, which he did. MTV was kind of in a strange position. They were repositioning themselves. They had just canceled Headbangers Ball, but MTV were still massive at the time. Pinfield's early days with the network would see him sit in weekly meetings with others, determining what videos they were going to play. If you've read Pinfield's book, he gives a fascinating account of the pressure that MTV was under, or rather the record labels were under, and how they applied pressure to the folks at MTV, even lobbying them, taking them out to dinners and drinks. Some label people even claimed their jobs were on the line if certain bands couldn't get played. As for 120 minutes, Largent eventually grew tired of the role, wanting to still work behind the scenes at the network. Pinfield was asked to guest host for a three-week period, starting with Oasis, who much like Depeche Mode, didn't want to host an episode. After the Oasis episode was filmed, Pinfield got the job as a permanent host, and he also got to host another show that bore some similarity to Headbangers Ball playing heavier acts called Matt Rock. Due to the popularity of so-called alternative rock at the time, MTV launched another alternative music show. It was a weeknight program called Alternative Nation, hosted by Kennedy, who some of you guys may recognize these days from Fox News. It would premiere in 1992 and ran until 1997. As alternative rock grew in popularity in the 90s, the acts that were featured on 120 Minutes were now becoming big business for the record labels, and they became more mainstream, resulting in a bit of a backlash. Those misfit kids and outcasts who found a home in 120 Minutes were now disappointed to see that their favorite bands were becoming mainstream, and maybe nothing is a better example of that than when Nirvana premiered Smells Like Teen Spirit on 120 Minutes, and soon enough the video was all over MTV's primetime hours. Director Kevin Kerslake, who worked on a bunch of alternative rock music videos that actually appeared on 120 Minutes, would remark in the book I Want My MTV, it was a point of honor among bands on 120 Minutes not to show up in regular rotation on MTV. They wanted to be the bad kids on the block who showed up for those two hours on Sunday and ran riot. By the late 90s, around 1998, the show's relevance was starting to be questioned. The LA Times actually published an article in 1998 with a headline that read, Searching MTV for a Sharper Cutting Edge. The article would state, and I quote, the aesthetic, if not the anti-establishment mindset of underground culture now represents the norm in pop culture, giving examples of body piercings, tribal tattoos, and vintage clothing, and the supposed new underground electronica hasn't quite fulfilled its promise as the next wellspring of rock creativity. They would go on to add in the article, this leaves 120 minutes with the task of defining who is pushing the pop envelope. Recent 120 minutes episodes have reflected the confusion over just what is cutting edge in 1998 by continuing to feature established artists, Blur, Foo Fighters, Beck. 120 minutes trajectory started to turn into what really happened to Headbangers Ball. Both shows were playing artists who were established and already had videos played in MTV's primetime hours and on other slots, so it wasn't necessarily cutting edge anymore. Couple this with the rise of reality TV on MTV and things were changing. Pinfield would stay with the show until 1999 when he got a job for the USA Network before landing a job with Columbia Records. Since then, he's worked for television and satellite radio. The show would have one more host for the time being, which was Dave Holmes, who hosted 120 Minutes until the summer of 2000 when it was pulled off the air. The show got a short reboot from 2001 to 2003 on MTV2. It was during the final broadcast in 2003 that host Jim Shearer was actually joined by two former 120 Minutes hosts, Dave Kendall and Matt Pinfield. The show would once again be rebooted in 2011 until 2013 and Matt Pinfield would reprise his role on the program. Since 2018, MTV Classic actually airs a show on Sundays called 120 Minutes. This version of the show, however, has no host and no highlights and instead prominently features artists who were part of the original 120 Minutes from the 80s and 90s. 120 Minutes was actually in the news last year when it was reported that a fan of the program, Chris Reynolds, created a playlist of every song that's ever been played on 120 Minutes across all iterations of the show. And specifically for you folks who love the program, there's even a cool website called 120minutes.org that lets you go year by year, see detailed info on every single episode, what music videos were played, and even has links to clips that are available online. Sadly, earlier this year, former host Louis Largen would pass away at the age of 58. It was following his time with MTV, he worked at Island Def Jam Records where he was the senior vice president of a &R, and he signed artists including Sum 41 and Andrew WK. That does it for today's video, guys. Let me know your thoughts on 
than 120 minutes in the comment section below. And as always, if you guys want to give me suggestions on which topics to cover, use the link in the description box below. And we'll see you again, Rock and Roll True Stories.